that there's a recording in progress. And so let me give Jane and Fred an introduction. Um, they're longtime members of the Patuxent Bird Club and also uh, Prince George's Audubon. Jane is originally from the state of Michigan. She earned a bachelor's at Michigan State University and a master's from The Ohio State University in mathematics. Um, she worked in Chicago for a while and then moved to Maryland. She met Fred on a kayaking trip and they've been together ever since. Um, she says that she likes to go out to bird or botanize or hike or kayak or garden. And she was an employee at the Tuxum Wildlife Research Center and did a lot of work with Chan Robbins while she was there. She retired in 2013. Fred has a background in astronomy, optics, and statistics, um, aeronomy and geophysics kind of field. He has a PhD in astronomy from the University of Florida and has done research at University of South Florida, Goddard Space Flight Center, and NOAA. He's a native of this area, having been raised in Silver Spring, and he started birding around here at the age of 14. He eventually um, joined MOS and PGAS. Fred has been active for a long time in, in bird conservation and was the MOS representative to Partners in Flight for many years. Um, let's see, uh, Jane and he have been birding together for over 30 years, and their trip to Ecuador that they're going to talk about tonight is one of their recent, sort of recent, um, overseas expeditions. We won't talk about our ill-fated trip to Colombia this summer. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Fred to share his screen. Sure. How's that? Oh, that's good. That's perfect. OK, good to go. OK, fine. We're talking okay. today about um, Ecuador as a birding destination. And why are we considering Ecuador? Well, I, I look, at, look at it like this, like a history. Now, all of us here probably have been birding for a long time. And we start off birding in our neighborhood, our state, and we're excited about all the birds that are new. But after a while, we face the most diverse part here. And span horizons. We go to new places like the Eastern Shore, and then Florida, then Texas, then Arizona, maybe California. And after, after some years, we, when we build up a life list of maybe about 600, then, then it, it, it seems to, to us often that it's time to expand our horizons further. Hey, hey, Fred, Fred, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, sure. But when you're gesturing with your hands. Yeah, it gets in the way like this. Yeah. It's causing feedback in the mic. Mic, yipes, all right. Yep. What do you want me to do? Right. OK, so. We're going to get tape and tie your hands down. Any, anyway, I'll sit on them. OK. okay. Um, so uh, for Americans, it, going out of the country means going south, going into the neotropics, the, the um, um, uh, tropical countries of, of uh, America. And the first place we usually go is Costa Rica. I'd like to ask if, if uh, you all are uh, up on the screen, how many have been to Costa Rica before? Mm. At, le at least to Costa Rica. Huh? Can't see? How many of you have? People well, are muted, so it's hard for them to so, answer. Okay. Well, all right. I have. <laughs> so some of us have been. Now, <clears throat> many people have gone to Costa Rica more than once, sometimes even four times, because it's such a good country to visit. But even there, you might start running out of new birds to see. So <clears throat> you think about what's next. Who, who, who's next in line? They think, well, maybe uh, Venezuela. Well, we went, once went to Venezuela, actually, and had a good time there. But you can't go, you can't go there now. Uh, th there's, there's no food there. 
And even if you did try to go and bring your own food, you couldn't get in because you'd be knocked over by all the people trying to get out. So that doesn't work. Now, next in line comes Colombia. And Colombia is up and coming. And we heard from a speaker earlier this year about how uh, Colombia is coming online as a birding destination. And, and we all wish them well. <clears throat> but in the uh, until until now, it is, it's not been a birding destination. Not a good one because of <clears throat> all the trouble that they've had, fortunately, that they've overcome. So <clears throat> we've tradition, you might say traditionally looked as the next country as Ecuador. And it's a it's a, a country very much like Costa Rica in that it's peaceful, democratic, fairly prosperous. So it's a good country to visit. And we're going to uh, come on. Yeah. Here, here is uh, South America, and here is Ecuador within South America, a small country, a small country on the Pacific. By the way, the capital is the same longitude as D.C., exactly due south of us, just, just happens. And so this does indeed look like a small country, but I might mention that it's about the same size as Arizona. It's the same size as, as uh, Great Britain. So it's not all that small. And this next slide shows a little better context. Here's the outline of Ecuador imposed in the North Atlantic. Okay, and you see it covers, it would cover all of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and West Virginia, and with room left over. So looked at that way, it's, it's not all that small. In fact, uh, it turns out it has a very high <clears throat> bird list, one of the highest in the world. Now here's a map, a topo map of Ecuador to show how it's set up. And of course the, the uh, topography controls the distribution of birds. So here, here are the Andes mountains running right through the middle of the country. Some of them are quite high. In fact, uh, Antisana is, I believe, 16 and a half thousand feet, their highest uh, mountain. And here's the equator of, of running through the country. Here's, uh, here's Quito, the capital, nicely situated at 9,000 feet, making it uh, mild and uh, comfortable, as the British used to say, healthy for Europeans. Down here is their biggest city, Guay Guayaquil. I would, of course, uh, the international plane um, uh, um, traffic is into Quito, the capital, and also to Guayaquil. If you're arranging a uh, tour trip, make sure that they don't take you into Guayaquil because it's too far from uh, the centers of activity and you'd lose you lose time of traveling. So you come into, most people come into uh, Quito. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we see that there's a, a mountain massif, and of course it has size and has slopes. And those slopes vary from, from very low, a few hundred feet, up, up to 12,000 feet. And <clears throat> on this side is, um, 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 low, low level terrain. And it's not very good burning because this is where, where the colonists first landed and they developed this into uh, agriculture and pasture. So there's not much habitat in here, but I'll tell you something about it uh, in a minute that it is very interesting despite that. Here on the other side, the mountains slope down, the, the uh, water drains out into an Amazon, uh, Amazon terrain, Am Amazon-like, and you think, well, gee, you must be getting into Brazil. But no, because Peru comes around and curves up like this. And so the next country here is Peru. North is, uh, of course, Colombia. Also part of um, Ecuador, of course, as you know, is the Galapagos Islands. And we're not concerned with that today. And really, um, in a way, it's just a, a coincidence that the Galapagos falls within the um, 
uh, boundaries of uh, Ecuador. So if one were to take a trip to the Galapagos, I would not recommend trying to combine it with a trip to Ecuador. You would be um, taking time from Ecuador that you should be more probably be spending on uh, the mainland. All right, so now this um, topography determines the ra ranges of the, of the different species and almost completely controls, controls that. Let's uh, take a look at how that works. But before we leave here, I want to point out a couple of uh, places. Here's Quito. Here's Tandiapa. Tandiapa, what is that? And down here are some other places, Buenaventura and Harupe. Tandiapa is a famous birding lodge. And if you go there, and of course you'll arrange um, a tour a trip with, with leaders, no doubt that's how, how you will do that. And you're experienced doing that. So I don't have to tell you about, about uh, how to do that or, who, or even whom we let, went with because you, you have your favorites and you know how to do that. But anyway, just kind of recall it that it's uh, up here. <clears throat> now we'll look at uh, uh, some range maps. Now down here, the shaded is, is the, uh, the Andes. And so a bird, birds are often specialists for particular elevations. So this well, a particular bird might have a uh, elevation preference and it would be all down the slope from top to bottom and wouldn't occur any, anywhere else. That's often a typical range. Likewise, it could be on the east side and the range would be down on the east side, like that. Or could be on both sides, not necessarily, sometimes it is. And the range could be right down the middle of the Andes in the Paramo, the high, high elevation of levels. Now, uh, another range could include all this Amazonia, low-lying, humid, um, jungle-like area. And birds, which are uh, specialists here, would not be found or would not be found here, vice versa. So you have those distinct ranges. One more, down here at the bottom is this area called the Tumbas, and it's a little different from, from all the others. I'll, ex I'll explain it. Uh, later when we get to examine uh, this uh, more, more closely. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, we, we uh, here, let, let me just relax here. Um, up, or, up around the Tandiapa Lodge, is the relics of an old highway called the uh, Nono Mendo Road. It was a, a major road once, but years ago, decades ago, the government replaced that road with a, a modern road and bypassed this, this road. And so it's not used for traffic anymore, but it is open for birders. And it, it's such, such a great place to walk into the uh, habitat of that part of the country, uh, up north of the capital, that is sometimes called the Hummingbird Highway. Okay, now up there, Tandiapa, I want to recommend that you that you stay there, whatever else you do, because from that location, there's there's a road that goes down in elevation to lower levels, one that goes up to higher levels, and you can take the uh, van or your your own car if you if you were renting a car up or down to get to different um, um, elevation levels now here we are now on the hummingbird highway the old no no window bird that old timers talk, talk about here we are walking along lagging behind the rest of the group as you can. so hummingbirds when you think of south america you think hummingbirds and so we should uh, uh, take a look at some hummingbirds. I might mention, now we have about, what, 10 hummingbirds in, in North America. And 
Costa Rica has uh, 80 hummingbirds, and Ecuador has 135 hummingbirds. I mean, 135 species. And out of uh, 330 in the country and, and, and in the world, 330. So Ecuador has a, a good fraction of the world's hummingbirds. So that, that makes it a good uh, country to visit from the point of view of hummingbirds. Now let's uh, maybe take a look at some. So. Chestnut breasted coronet. Can I slide this by the way? Um, you might wonder, and it's a beautiful bird, and I was lucky to get this picture from nature. You might wonder, why is it called a coronet instead of a hummingbird? Well, my theory is this. They have coronets, star frontlets, hill stars, wood stars, Jacobins, coquettes, mangoes, uh, Incas. So I think that they have all those names besides hummingbirds because you'd run out of names otherwise, you'd run out of colors. So they had to make up these other names to uh, make room for the uh, descriptive names of the birds, that's my theory. Violet-bellied hummingbird. Note the, the intense iridescence on the, on the uh, chest and belly of this guy in, in also blue violet. The buff-tailed buff -tailed coronet. This, this is uh, the male. Now here's an interesting hummingbird. Doesn't have any iridescence. There's no iridescence on the throat, uh, not on the chest, like hummingbirds usually do. So what's going on here? Well, here's the iridescence. It's on the back. Have you ever seen anything like that? Um, it's the shining hummingbird, not all that, not all that rare bird. And this is fantastic to look at. The, the uh, colors wink on and off and change as, as you look at it. It's all in the back of the hummingbird. A shining sunbeam. White neck Jacobin. It has this uh, whoop, has this uh, white white neck mark. Um, and there are several uh, species of Jacobin. Tourmaline sun angel, so-called because the uh, iridescent throat has the color of the mineral tourmaline. And what, what is tourmaline famous for? Does anybody know tourmaline? It is a birefringent mineral. Did you know that? Birefringent, like feldspar. And here, besides, it has this nice uh, iridescence on the forehead or front, as, as you call it. Sparkling violet ear. Now the violet ears have violet around, uh, behind the ears, there are several species. <clears throat> this is a very nice, pretty one with a um, violet on the belly. Here's the green violet ear, green, except with the violet on, on the ear. Brown violet ear. That's the violet, but he's otherwise all plain brown. Empress Brilliant, uh, another little group of hummingbirds called the Brilliants. So here the iridescence is on, on the uh, wings. Fawn Breasted Brilliant, same thing, the iridescence is, is on the back of the wings. One of my favorites, Rufus Tail Hummingbird, of course, is the Rufus Tail, and it is. Uh, a widespread hummingbird also occurs all the way up to Costa Rica. And we saw some in Colombia. That's a very, very pretty bird. I was uh, pleased to get this uh, photograph from nature. Puffleg, golden breasted puffleg. There's a group of hummers in uh, deeper, well, outside of uh, Central America that have this white puffiness on, on their legs. And so they're called puffleg. This one's the golden breast. Here's the brown Inca with iridescence on the throat, otherwise uh, kind of dark. Buff wing star frontlet. Star frontlet because they have a, a uh, disc of bright iridescence on the front. Here, uh, it has this uh, buffy wing bars 
That's the male, of course. The female is quite different, but it still has the puffy blue marks. Collard Inca, a, a, a handsome study, I think, in the black and white. The, the white collar goes, goes around, go, you can't see it, but it go, goes around the neck. Purple bibbed white tip. White tip because it has a white tip at the tail, the tail tip. The, the female is uh, duller than the male. Green thorn tail. Notice the peculiar tail, which, which reduces down to like, like uh, spikes. A few species of thorn tail. They're like that. Purple throated wood star. This is the immature. That's sort of a sawed off little hummingbird, chunky. And the, the uh, immature is uh, rather different from the, from the uh, adult. And you, you see many more of these than you do adults. Now, booted racket tail. You may have seen pictures of these, but what they do is, is nibble off the feathers on the tail, leaving this chunk here at the, at the tip, which is like standalone. And the bird can swing that around and make a, spe a spectacular display of, of this uh, racket uh, zipping around. And that, that's uh, interesting to the, to the female. You've heard of sword tail, the sword bill hummingbird, you've heard of it. And it really exists. This is. Just wanted to uh, yeah, maybe show you all of it. It really is that long. And how does it rest? But how does it sleep? It has to hold its head straight up so that the um, um, uh, bill doesn't exert any torque on the neck. And they have to sleep like that. And finally, here's the violet ta 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 tailed silk. You may have seen the um, um, long tailed silk which is like this, but the tail is just plain. The violet tail has a very bright violet tail. How can it do that? And you wonder, is, is that, can that only be um, 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 iridescence to give you that much violet from, from the spectrum of the sun? And I, I almost wonder if there isn't some fluorescence going on there, I'd like to get a spectrum I'll take a reflection spectrum of that and see if it if there isn't any uh, maybe some fluorescence to give such an intense uh, violet tail. Well, it just doesn't seem natural. Okay, so uh, when we when we think of uh, uh, South America, another species we think of. Uh, is toucans, toucans like fruit, like the fruit loop character. So we're going to, going to look at a few toucans and and related. So this is the red-headed barbet, one of the family of barbets, which are birds which are maybe evolving still uh, to become toucans. And so they have this large blue, but not, not nearly as large as a real full-fledged toucan, red-headed. Barbara, very, very handsome bird. Yeah. Here's the uh, here's a toucanet, bigger but not not a full fledged toucan. Red rump, crimson rump. You can't see it in this picture. Collared arasero. He does he does have a red rump here too. And to me, this looks like somebody somebody I know. But I can't place who it is. Somebody famous. Does it remind you of anyone? It, it, I think it reminds me of Groucho Marx. It just looks, somehow it reminds me of Groucho Marx. So that's the Aracel. It, it, uh, that's a Portuguese name, but it's, it, it's a, still a toucan. And the Choco, actually they say Choco, toucan, um, uh, which, which uh, is in uh, that's more on the western side of the country and has uh, ranges up into Colombia, but it's almost an endemic. So there are some nice toucans. Now, also, when you think, I'm going to take this, when you think of South America, 
you think of ant birds, I, I think you know the story. Throughout the um, jungle floor, there are swarms of ants, army ants, that go in columns, foraging and stirring up insects. And some members of other bird families have evolved to follow the ant swarm. So there's ant wrens, ant tanagers, ant shrikes, ant eaters, and ant pittas, all of which are different families that follow um, ant swarms. Now, the ant pittas are the most secretive and little known of the ant birds. Well, there's, there is a group called ant birds, but of all, all those ant birds, generally speaking, the ant pittas are, are the most obscure. They're, they're secretive, they're ground dwelling, and they actually hide out in grottos, almost underground, and very little about them and their life histories until they've all, probably all heard this story. But this gentleman, Angel Paws, a, 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 a gentleman, a, a farmer, not educated uh, in, in uh, wildlife or anything, but, but uh, a respectable gentleman who decided that he could, he could call out ant pittas from hiding. You've all heard this, so, so I won't go into it too much, but he revolutionized the study of ant pittas by luring them out, by calling them and rewarding them with worms. So he would call, Maria, or some other name, and the bird would eventually walk out right out into the open and accept the worms from his hands. And that revolutionized the study of animals. Now he has a uh, uh, nice uh, headquarters here. I think you can, you can rent rooms here and, and uh, um, buy different merchandisers here. He, he made these cutouts himself. Now maybe it's time to meet the gentleman. Yes, here he is. And he's uh, calling out the bird that from this deep dark grotto. Uh, first, what he did, uh, he, he cut leaves from the trees and laid them down in piles. He was very carefully set these piles of leaves down. Why did he do that? Because he then made though he off offered those for the ladies in the group to sit down on so they'd have they'd have nice uh, dry seating on this mud. So he, he, he's, a, he's an old-fashioned gentleman of the old schools. Now here he is with uh, his can of worms and he's about to call and offer offer them to the ant pennies. Well, that would be a worm that's too big. I, mean, I, would, I wouldn't get, I, I wouldn't try to get you know, this worm, unless maybe you cut it out first. But these very huge earthworms are found in Ecuador. Let's see what came out. I would say this, this guy didn't come from that spot, but uh, Angel Paws called him from a from a hillside and he lives along uh, mountain streams and he came walking down the stream and finally out out in into view to accept his uh, earthworms the giant ant pit who really is much bigger than any of the other ant pitties now, now here, here's uh here here's the here's the uh, first ant pit that he called out the chestnut crown ant pit, a beautiful bird. This is maybe the, my favorite picture that I've ever taken. Notice their, their uh, structure, long legs, because they're walking in the forest floor and they have to get above the leaves. Also, almost no tail. So here is a, another ant pit, the yellow bellied ant pit, even though in this picture, uh, we can't see uh, we can't see much of the front. But notice the almost complete absence of tail. Don't rest yet.
Let's see what else he got. The mustache to him. And this is the mustache on it. Not, not quite so clear here, but this is the mustache on it. And he, he too came out of another dark grotto. And I'm, I uh, called upon Marshall to let me have this, uh, show this picture because when I was there, I took some pictures um, that would have been good except that the camera was set on a shutter priority and uh, all those, all those uh, pictures uh, with that malfaction. Uh, were, were lost. So this is really obscure, obscure. And, uh, and here, here is another one taken by the gentleman who knows the tour about perhaps from uh, Costa Rica, Mario Cordova. And, and look here at, at, at him, he almost looks like a fledgling, almost like a nestling because of the absence of the tail. But it's, a, it's an adult, plain back. And it really is plain. So that's that's a, a, a taste of what you can get about uh, from ant pickles. If you go to Ecuador, be sure that your tour group includes a visit to to uh, Refugio Paz because it's an experience like no other. Now, when we talk about uh, South America. We're talking about uh, tanagers because America has about four tanagers: uh, um, scarlet tanager, summer tanager, uh, western tanager, hepatic tanager. All red birds, um, but we and they're nice, but we only got four. Costa Rica has about thirty tanagers. Comparisons. Costa Rica has 30 different, 30 different tanagers. Ecuador has 90 species of tanagers, a lot of tanagers. And there are viewing stations set up here and there uh, that you can uh, uh, access easily from a central location like Tandarapa. Get up early and drive out, drive out in, in, uh, in time to see the activity. Uh, here, here is such a viewing station. Here's my camera, three, if you're interested, 300 millimeter fixed, fixed, not seen, uh, on a Nikon uh, uh, body. And, and uh, of course, the usual 1.4 times um, extender or bar below, as we call them in Australia. Notice these scopes, the giant scopes. In fact, they needed a fork, fork um, mount tripods to hold them up. And these folks are from India, and uh, my observation is that India has a uh, has a uh, growing upper class of wealthy people that afford can afford these scopes. Also, China. So when you're birding tropically, you see the, the biggest scopes are usually um, uh, with uh, Chinese and Indians. So here's. Uh, Typical day. Here is our wonderful guide, Jose Iana, Ianas, uh, uh, looking on. Now we'll see some of those red tanagers, see what they have in the uh, tropics. What bright green, even, even a little bit iridescent, glistening green, early named tanager. Always, always a bright spot. Let's look at some more. Golden mate tanager with the golden mate. Golden tanager, beautiful, beautiful bird, rather widely distributed. Black chested mountain tanager, and the black goes all the way down his chest, so you, you can't see it. Say mountain tanager doesn't mean they're really in the mountains, but they are, they are tanagers which are at higher elevations than most tanagers. They can't really go up in, into the mountains because they, they need deciduous, you know, deciduous trees. But anyway, that's the black chested mountain tanager. And some of some of them are quite beautiful. Um, here's the black chin mountain tanager, with just black on the chin. Blue on the wing like wings like most mountain tanagers have. Here, here in fact, it is a blue winged mountain tanager. Flame faced tanager. If you've been to Costa Rica, you've probably seen this bird because it occurs all the way, all the way up there. 
Rufus throat tanager, are less common, less common tanager because it's Rufus throat and all speckly otherwise. And grass green tanager, he too is green, but notice the facial area. This is bare skin and it has that red color. So that's, that's, uh, it's, it's not plumage. That's how he's, that's how he's uh, configured. Silver throated tanager, a pair of them with, they're all yellow, but they have these silver, greenish silver throats. They're very handsome looking. Now, I'm making a, uh, uh, a, a, a diverse view of uh, the tanagers because in the recent taxonomic changes, it's been found that the euphonias are really like, really, really in the same group as tanagers. And there are many euphonias, mostly with a pattern like this, um, blue and yellow. And then the exact pattern uh, differentiates the different species. It's the orange belly euphonia. The flower piercings, they too are in the tanager group now. Here, here is a... Uh, masked flower piercer, and if you're not familiar with it, the, the, the bill so has a tip up, upward pointing at the end. And what it does is pierce the bottom underneath of a blossom, and that way get to the nectar without having to be a hummingbird. There's, there's quite a few of flower piercers, I think about 10, 10 in the uh, tropics. And he's, and they're usually uh, some combination of blue and black. So here's a nice masked flower picture, uh, piercer. I was lucky to get that picture. And the, everybody's favorite, the green honey creeper, striking, striking bird. Notice the red eye. So I should look at for a moment. No need to brush. And the yellow breasted brush finch, even the brush finches now are found to be more closely related to. Tanagers are not, are not really finches. Okay, now um, we've uh, uh, been in, in the rainforest, the cloud forest area. Now to go up in the hill country, go up in the mountains, actually to the top of the mountains, to the Paramo, that means the treeless areas above tree line uh, in, in the mountains. And interestingly, you can drive up there, you can drive from Quito and just get on, get on a you know, fairly good road, drive right on up. It, it's the, the way that topography is, Quito is kind of in a little dip and you can drive up it like, like an inclined plane and get easily into the mountains with nothing to it. You see though, the, the degradation of the, of the hillsides for, uh, this looks like for, uh, probably for, for pasture. And anyway, uh, hillsides are, are, are facing uh, clearing. And that's kind of a problem. Now we get really, uh, really uh, up, up high and we're above the tree, the tree line. A land of mists. Sometimes the mists come rolling in and, and uh, blind you. And hikers and mountain climbers are at great risk. And, and often they get lost and, and uh, fall off cliffs and stuff. So if you go there, you have to post a bond with the government to cover rescue operations in case you get lost or injured. You have to. Here in the distance is Mount Antasana. You see that, that snow clad mountain that figures in a, in a lot of their uh, iconic pictures, uh, about 17,000 feet. Well, we're up in the high country, so of course we have, this is the land of the Incas, and of course we have the Yamas. Do you know how they got their name? You can ask me afterwards, I'll tell you. Andy and Guan, one of those birds that is closely, you know, just not much evolved after they separated from the dinosaurs. It's a very primitive bird. Uh, I wish you could see it, the tail is very long, and the, the pigment, on them has been identified as the same pigment in the early feathered dinosaurs and transitioning to transitions, transitioning to birds. 
and everybody wants to see the economy kind of rare, kind of almost endangered, and the incon board, but not as endangered as our California condor. And you see them flying in, in the, over the valleys th through the Andes, huge and eight foot wingspans. Just remarkable to, uh, to, to see them in flight. Um, I, I wish we could have a video to, to show you in, uh, in, in full, full flight display. So Andy and Connor with the white, co white collar around the, around the uh, head. Okay, Andy and Coop. Now this tells us something. Here's, a, here's a, an Andy and Coop, it doesn't look any different from our coup, our regular North America, our regular American coup, except what it is is that the frontal shield goes up a little higher. This, this is often the case with the uh, uh, Andean species. A bird went up there and evolved to live in that habitat, but it didn't have to change its, its uh, superficial appearance. Uh, really, it didn't have to change it that much. Maybe just so that the males and females would recognize it. So here's an Andy and Coop, and you can only, only find it up there in those mountains. But but it's not anything spectacularly different, spectacularly different from our Coop. Now, different story with the lap, lap wave. This is an Andy and lap wave, and it's much different from our, you see sometimes a northern lap wave that comes down kind of black and white. From, very different from that, and uh, or the southern lap wing that you see in Costa Rica, but this is just uh, uh, confined to the, to the high country. The Andean lap wing. Andean gull, kind of same thing, not much different from some of our gulls. You might think, well, at first glance, it was a, uh, maybe a laughing gull, but no, it's, it's not, not as dark as a laughing gull. And in all plumages, the spot, of course, um, is, is retained uh, uh, when it's not in full breeding plumage with the, with the black cap, but that black spot always remains there. Bill is much smaller than our laughing gull, too. So that's the Andean gull. Now, this is, a, this is a rare, unusual bird and hard to find. Our guide took extraordinary measures to locate this for us. It's on the top of a mountain to which a road goes to a radio tower. That's how you get up there. And if you look carefully, move the spell HC slide. If you look carefully, look very carefully, you can see the corrupt the um, um, fine details on the, the scalloping. I'm just trying to the scalloping along the neck is very beautiful view if you see it up close. Unfortunately, by the time we found it, it was it was uh, after sunset. So I was taking this against the, the sky that was still bright and very hard, hard to do. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture of this richly colored, beautiful bird. It's not nothing to do with snipes. Um, I, like, like I thought, I was looking on the ground for snipes, but it's not anything. Uh, related to the snipes, it's more related to our say, a wild turkey or something, something uh, related to that. Move a spell, you see something. Not a common bird. You're, you're lucky if you get to see it. Giant hummingbird. Now, I can't prove it's giant, but you could only go by the telephone wire. Um, Marsha took the, Marsha let me kindly use this picture because she was in the same place, a uh, different year and got a good picture of it. Mine was against a, a white sky background. You couldn't see any details hardly. So it, it's a hummingbird, it's very plain. There's no iridescence on it. And you wonder, why is this hummingbird so big and so plain? And maybe we can, maybe we can learn something from it. For one thing, it's up high where it's cold. So, why would a hummingbird, how could a hummingbird be up there? Sure, they can go into torpor to survive a cold night. They can do that. But in the daytime, they have to turn on their metabolism 
and it might be too cold for them. But the way, one way to come back cold is to be bigger, right? Because the, the mass goes as the, uh, the mass of the river goes as the, the all belts being equal, goes as the cube of the size, but the surface area goes on as the square of the size. So, so the uh, bigger, bigger uh, uh, organism sheds less heat if it, than a uh, smaller organism. Just like our purple finches sort of turn into uh, pine gross beaks of the same principle. And he's the only hummingbird in town, so the, the females aren't confused by it. And they know that must be a male hummingbird when, the, when they see it. Notice the huge wings, by the way. The, this is a, 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 an instance of a saber wing, and the saber wing subfamily of uh, hummingbirds with these big, long, sweeping wings. Oh, well, lucky to get these pictures, are very uncommon. Uh, black winged ground doves, but they're just like ground doves, except they have black wings and they're really difficult. And they're uh, uh, modified for living in, in the uh, caramel. Carunculated character. What's a, what's a caruncle anyway? Well, it means that it has, has uh, knobby things on, on the face. The nose of it has, makes it carunculated. So it's another character like that. Audubon's character of different species. And these are quite common uh, on the Paramo, and you see them scattered here and there over, over, the, uh, over the grasslands. But he's a handsome bird, but huge also. Also, now they're also uh, passerines up there that have adapted. Here's a, a beautiful bird, I think, but very handsome with the uh, many fine striped, many striped uh, canister. And here's his mate over here. I wish I had to maybe enlarge that a little bit. See, and he lives in these bushes. Agile tit tyrant. What's that? Mean? The, the, the tyrants and the tit tyrants are a subfamily of flycatchers. Some are at low ele ele elevations, but this one's adapted up there to the high elevation. Otherwise, it's not that much different. He's a totally, totally different species. Agile tit tyrant. And he was singing away. And finally, the black flower piercer. We saw the blue, we saw, saw the other flower piercer. This is just another flower piercer who's evolved to live up there and, and uh, uh, feed on a, a different suite of blossoms. And it was just all black all over. Otherwise, just like the other flower piercers. I could say something about, about Darwin's search for. You know, that led to evolution, but I'll hold, I'll hold off on that. But you could, you could begin to see that a person could develop a theory based on South American birds because the families have so many representatives. And indeed, uh, William Wallace was working on it at the same time as Darwin. And he started in South America and he collected hundreds of species and notes and shipped them back to England to work on, and they fell over to get the star all over. Now we were talking about the tumbas a while ago, and now we're going to take a look at that uh, part of the uh, country. And it's marked by these crazy trees, Saiba trees. They look like something out of what Madagascar, and it may be for water retention because it's so dry. By the way, this tree makes a, a white substance. That's something like looks like cotton, and the people gather it to use to stuff pillows and, 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 and cushions and stuff. It's like, it's like real cotton. This shows what it's like dry, and the, the reason is that if you remember on the map, this is fairly near um, its lower elevations, fairly near the, the west side of the country, near the, near the ocean. But at that point, there's a range of hills uh, inland from, from the Pacific, and they serve to, to um, uh, condense the uh, water vapor in the air currents blowing over from the ocean. And, and hence, this area is deprived of moisture. So it's very dry like this. And in fact, um, 
it, it's it's a, a comfortable area because it's so dry that the that the heat is not bothersome. It reminds me of being in maybe in Florida in like in in the winter. It's like that, and and uh, of course you'd expect there to be fires, and there are there are lots of fires. And you see smoke hanging over the, over the place um, all the time. So that's that's the environment here in this Tumbles area. Now, the way the way to visit there is that there are no regular commercial lodges. These are research stations manned by the NGO called Choco the Choco Toco Foundation. I'll tell you if you're interested. I'll tell you uh, what how they got that name of Choco Toco. But they have several sites down there where, where they do research and, and uh, protect the uh, uh, endangered species uh, and, and accept visitors whom they house in these, these really lovely cabins, not, not in a one big building, but everybody has a little cabin. Very pleasant. So in the morning, you get up and you can just look out your balcony and see good birds without leaving home. Case in point here is uh, this red masked parrot, which showed up on our railing, and he, he's an unusual parrot. In fact, in fact, they were doing research um, on these parrots in uh, efforts to to uh, to protect them, to find out um, uh, what what they uh, needed. So, red masked parrot, nice one. White tail jay, I would call it, sometimes called white uh, white neck jay, uh, a jay that has a lot of white in it. I think that's that's unique. But anyway, it's a real jay, right? Two jays, and it's it's uh, yelping all the time and making this uh, sound. And at nighttime, at, at sunset, all of them all around the all, all around the refuge are, are calling out with their peculiar call. Here, interesting. I'll, I'll outline it so you can see just where it actually is. The uh, black cat sparrow with this you know, big puffy head, right? like a big crest, and that's that's found only in this part of the country. Oh, gold, golden, golden grosbeak showing the black wings, and here showing a ventral view. So you see, it's all golden. Sort of like a blue gross beak, except golden. And the white edged oriole, so called because white edges are the wing, and it's not a yellow tailed oriole because it doesn't have the yellow in the tail. So it's a different species down there. White edged oriole. So much for the, the uh, tumba species that I had. You go down there, you're, you're kind of on your own. Um, they have a family mess hall and people go and uh, have, have dinner there and you, and you might meet other interesting people might be a research team might might be um, someone doing a, a thesis or it might be people some foreign country and, and you just rub elbow, rub elbows with all these people um but there's no guides you'd have to arrange to get a guide if you wanted we did not have a guide, but one of the caretakers there did show us around one day, and it was very nice uh, to, to have him point out many of the birds to us, and, and we slipped him a little tip. Okay, now here's like a catch-all final thing here, catch-all of oddball species I thought you'd like to see. Mot, hoopy mot mot, you know there's mot mots in, in uh, tropical America. Uh, in, in Costa Rica, it, it's the uh, turquoise brown model. This guy is different because he has a, a black on the crown. And, and they're all somewhat alike. They're related to kingfishers, actually. And they all do the same thing, whatever species they are. They, they pluck away the feathers on this part of the, uh, of the uh, of, of the tail so that the tip of the tail seems to be suspended, and it, just like the racket tail hummingbird, for some reason they all do that. 
some of that's the hooping not not does it hoop yes sometimes it does nope not the red eye there's a, a small group of birds called fruit eaters and some of them very colorful handsome birds and people don't mind not not like the early americans who sh shot all the carolina parakeets even though they're fruit eaters that people tolerate them. do they have do they have caprimulgids in ecuador yes they do they're mostly night hawks many species of night hawks here is one at rest in the daytime they're hard to photograph of course at night this is the wire tail nightjar. And look, it, 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 he's, he's in semi torpor. Look, he's, look, he's looking at us. He, he, he is not. Now, the male has very, this is a female, but the male has very long streamers, like, like a foot and a half long, that are spectacular when he swoops around at dusk. And if I could get a video of that. But anyway, that's the wire to me. Uh, Torrent ducks, they have. These are ducks that love the uh, raging, raging rivers. And they splash around in the foam and it doesn't seem to bother them. They're something like our harlequin ducks, but not, not related to them. Don't, don't look anything like them. There's, there's the handsome male. And here's it's sexually dimorphic, so here's the uh, different looking female. Now, Rufus headed Chachalaga. This is another of those primitive birds. Notice the long tails that they, that they have. If you've been in Texas, then you've heard, I can't ask you if you've ever have been, uh, seen these in Texas, was the Rufus Chachalaga. Uh, I mean, the, uh, what, the plain, plain Chachalaga, Chachalaga. And the male and female go back and forth like they're arguing, arguing with each other. Uh, Yes, you did. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. And then they would raise an eternal din. Well, now we come to the uh, Rufus headed Chachalaka and we see that it is indeed a very mean looking bird. And it is. The local people use these for watchdogs. And if they don't, if they, if they detect uh, an intruder, they'll attack it. Let's see, let's see evidence of that. I came up from an un, uh, no place I shouldn't have been, but to the caretaker's house from, from a different direction than normal. And these two chachalacas actually attacked me, landed on my head, took off my glasses, pulled out my hearing aid, and, and uh, carried on until the uh, um, uh, owners went until the owners um, call them off. And I was at, at their mercy with the, these two chachalacas. Chachalaca, okay. And I think that's a good place, a good place to end, end the talk. And I will just go to a, a, another, another slide, of some, uh, just some good information and kind of summarizing some things I've said. And, and you can just uh, look at that. But uh, I've, I've finished my talking now. I think this is a good time to uh, open up for discussion. And uh, so I, I will, uh, you, you may unmute now, I think, if, you, if you'd like to. Yeah, thank you very much, Fred. Really a great talk and you have such great photos, so many great photos. Uh, that one of the chachalaca on your head is the best chachalaca photo I've ever seen. That's I thought, great. I thought you would like that. Jane yes. loves it. I, and chachalacas are some of my favorite birds. So that's a wonderful photo. And as Fred said, feel free to unmute. And I am going to stop the recording now. Um,